our title is intended to be a provocative one, which is public aspects of private equity. And you could take a view of private equity that says, by definition, it's private. These are private transactions amongst private actors. The terms are not disclosed. The strategies are not disclosed. And the markets work uh, efficiently uh, when, in fact, these uh, actors in private equity are left to pursue uh, return on investment unfettered. So you could make an argument that private equity is entirely private and should not concern itself with public good, should not concern itself with any uh, public accountability. That's one view. Another more nuanced view that you could take is when you look at the ecosystem of private equity, we find many players uh, and institutions that in fact have a social mandate into, as part of what they do. So one clear example of that, as we'll be hearing from Emily, are the limited partners, the asset owners, who invest in private equity funds. And certainly many of them come from the public sector. Uh, they can include directly state-owned institutions or pension boards or uh, retirement funds and institutions that have in their missions a social aspect. So they care about stakeholders uh, and non-financial considerations are part of what they do. So that's one way in which you can see a public aspect or public considerations coming into private equity uh, analysis. Also, of course, when private equity institutions make investments in companies, they are there to change those companies. They can expand those companies, they can grow those companies, they can create jobs, uh, they can create sustainable business models, they can do things that are very positive for society, or of course the reverse is also possible. So private equity funds and, and the firms that manage them, as Chris will be uh, representing, have a lot of influence over their portfolio companies. And that can be used for social benefit and at times might not be used for social benefit. So that's another aspect in which the public consideration comes into play. Uh, and as, of course, we're approaching an election year, there are many, many policy aspects that one can consider, all the way from taxation uh, to other considerations about how private equity uh, is in the spotlight when it comes to public discourse. So we're very pleased to be able to convene this panel. You have the bios of each of our speakers, uh, so I'll only augment a few points as, as by way of introduction. And each of them is stellar in his or her own right, uh, but also we're very excited by the composition we've been able to put together. So we'll be hearing from Emily from the perspective of LPs or limited partners who are the asset owners. So what is their perspective on these questions of social impact and ESG when it comes to private equity? Uh, Chris is at Bain Double Impact, which of course is a pioneer in thinking about uh, sustainable or socially responsible private equity. So we'll hear about their business model. We hear, we'll hear about how they work with LPs to achieve the ESG objectives that those LPs have. And from Donna, uh, we'll hear how this all fits into the broader universe of private equity. So how is private equity evolving? How will social considerations be factored going forward? Is this a trend that we expect to see continue or otherwise? Is it, it, is it uh, just a blip on the radar screen? So these are the questions that we'll explore uh, as we get into the panel. The structure will be that we'll do one round robin of the panelists. I'll give them a, a prompting question to get started. And we'll continue with a couple of more rounds uh, based on their initial comments. And we'll leave uh, the discussion amongst the panelists for the first, say, 40 minutes or so, uh, after which we'll open it up for questions. So we very much look forward to your questions and for your, for your input. Uh, and so we'll have a Q&A session and please do note down your questions, prepare them. I know the panelists are keen to hear from you as we move forward. So with that, uh, if we start with Emily Mendel, uh, so her institution, her organization, Institutional Limited Partners Association, also known as ILPA, uh, represents owners of assets. Uh, their members collectively manage over $2 trillion of assets only in private equity. And so, that uh, Emily was just saying it may be around half of all assets under management in the private equity asset class. So certainly, if anybody is well positioned to speak about what LPs uh, think, uh, it's Emily. So we're very privileged to have Emily. So Emily, if we could start with your uh, perspective on looking at your membership base and, and the limited partners. How do they approach the questions of ESG, the environment, social, and governance considerations? And how does that translate to their private equity investing? Sure, thank you. Thank you, Amir. And thanks everyone for, for having me and uh, having Ilpa here today. 
It's always funny when I say I'm from Ilfa, if you haven't heard of the organization, my, my son says, you know, mom, it sounds like a piece of Ikea furniture. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but that's who we are. And, um, and we do represent, um, today we have about 530 uh, institutional investors as our members. Uh, we're a global organization, so about 70% of our members are uh, here in North America, about another 20% uh, in Europe, and then we're rapidly growing uh, in Asia, Middle East, um, Australia, New Zealand. And, uh, you know, in relation to your question about how uh, limited partners are looking at ESG, uh, I would say that it's, it's very broad, it's very diverse, and it's evolving um, almost uh, monthly, I would say. So uh, a lot of it depends on a number of things. The, the type of limited partner that you are, and we'll talk a little bit about that, uh, the uh, geography and where you're doing business and what the, the norms are uh, in your uh, home country. And then, uh, to a lesser degree, the size of your institution and what you're actually able to uh, pull off and accomplish as, as a limited partner. And uh, across those various uh, spectrums, uh, I would categorize uh, the approach to ESG um, in, uh, in three ways. Uh, you're either a leader, you're a follower, or there's this other, uh, group that we kind of say are aware, don't care, um, and, and, and really don't have any interest in doing anything within ESG. And, uh, you know, those who do care, so the, the leaders and the ones who are, are trying to uh, do more in terms of uh, designing their investment strategies to reflect uh, the, uh, their beneficiaries and their needs, uh, are largely uh, public pension funds, as you mentioned. So public pension funds uh, have beneficiaries who uh, really do care about these things and, and put pressure on their investors to invest in a, a socially responsible way. Um, endowments and foundations that are mission-driven, so uh, universities uh, who have a student body who also have opinions on where money should be invested. Foundations who uh, have uh, charitable uh, endeavors and uh, other uh, criteria. Uh, family offices more and more are becoming uh, more interested in ESG investing, especially as the next generation comes and, and uh, takes over from uh, their parents. Uh, the next generation is just more interested in, in all of this stuff, which, which we believe is a good thing. Um, less so, or, you know, we see less sovereign wealth funds. There are some family offices who don't really have a lot of interest Corporate pensions can go either way, depending on the, the corporate philosophy of uh, th that particular organization. Uh, so we, we are seeing a mix. And um, then in terms of geography, uh, really uh, a lot of the ESG uh, push uh, started in Europe and started in the Nordics. So a lot of our Nordic members are really leading the way um, in terms of uh, instituting strategies uh, than uh, Canadians U.S. Um, less so uh, uh, in the Middle East in terms of ESG. Uh, and then when we talk about size, uh, smaller organizations just have a harder time uh, managing ESG strategies and, uh, and, and they have less resources to do it. So a larger organization like, like CalPERS or Washington State, um, they can hire a, a chief sustainability officer or a head of ESG. They can have ESG committees and all of their investments go through that investment committee. If you're a small family office, chances are you might ask somebody on the investment team to be thinking about ESG, but it's really hard to uh, institutionalize an ESG strategy. So, um, so of the folks who are uh, leading the way, uh, they're probably leading, and they're probably really interested in ESG, either because, number one, they are mission-driven and they are being asked by their beneficiaries to uh, take these strategies. But then there's this rising group of other uh, limited partners who are beginning to realize that their fiduciary duties include ESG. For, for a long time, you know, an LP would say, um, I have a fiduciary duty to produce the highest returns. And, uh, and that's really all I should care about. And uh, over time, and, and especially within the last several years, uh, there's a realization that there is an incredible amount of headline risk and uh, societal risk incorporated into some of these investing strategies. And you cannot create uh, value, long-term value, if you don't take into account these externalities and you don't take into account <coughs> risk mitigation. 
So um, those who are really uh, trying to get on the ESG bandwagon um, are really doing so in recognition of, uh, of those risks and trying to mitigate those risks. So we are, we are seeing a lot more of that. Wonderful. Well, thank you for playing the, setting the scene for us and giving us those segments, as you said. I'm sure we'll, when we go on with the discussion, it'll be interesting to hear what those leaders are doing that's different from the middle group. And then you talked about the aware but don't care segment, which, which would be interesting to find out more about their thoughts. Uh, let's turn now, though, to Chris from a manager's perspective. Uh, now, clearly, Bain Double Impact has represented, put itself out as, as being interested in ESG. Um, could you tell us how that plays out in your investment process? and how that plays out in your interaction with LPs and, and the portfolio companies with whom you interact. Thanks. Thanks, Amir, and um, well, thanks for having me. I'm hum humbled to be here, uh, humbled to be in the a room with the next generation of capitalists, uh, and humbled to be next to Emily. Two trillion dollars, three hundred and ninety million dollars. <laughs> That's, I think, the make, second... Make, make second, no mistake who has the power here. <laughs> sec, sec, second de <laughs> decimal of percentage. Um, uh, but uh, I mean, to, to, to answer your question, it's probably worth just describing uh, and saying a few words about uh, the double impact strategy uh, within the Bain Capital umbrella. So we, we are a new business unit um, within Bain Capital. Bain Capital is a large 100 billion plus asset manager created in 1984. Uh, Bain Capital Double Impact was created in 2015. Uh, so we're a dedicated business unit. We are, uh, we're effectively, from a, a financial perspective, a lower middle market fund targeting uh, similar uh, competitive financial returns, uh, but we have a double mandate, and that double mandate is the fact that we also uh, look to drive within every one of our portfolio companies measurable and intentional uh, social and or environmental returns. Um, and so, so how do we do that? Uh, and I think you, you mentioned uh, you mentioned a point which is uh, which is important to us, which is stakeholders, uh, and we're. Uh, we're, we're constantly trying to, to push forward uh, the, what fiduciary duty has been, um, uh, what uh, some, some might call shareholder, shareholder primacy. Uh, and so every time we look at a business, we look at its ecosystem of, of stakeholders. Uh, so a business has um, uh, its shareholders, it has its customers, it has its employees, it has the environment. It has its community, it has the public sector, it has its competitors, and there's a bunch of second order stakeholders we could talk about. Um, and, and as Emily said, uh, every business has impacts uh, to, on every one of its stakeholders, positive or negative. Uh, and through, our, uh, through the beautiful tool, which I've, uh, I found uh, exciting every day of, of, of private equity uh, and the governance we can bring to, to companies, we can, through our influence, manage to uh, increase the positive externalities that we, a business can have and reduce the negative externalities to the extent, uh, bo on both sides, to the extent that they are accretive to, uh, to um, our, our financial bottom line. Uh, so maybe, you know, taking out all the lingo, how does this, how, how does this materialize? Uh, it's uh, what our business does and how we do business. So we, we um, intentionality and measurability are, are very uh, uh, important for us and so we uh, in every business we look at we'll look at what the business does and how uh, it can have a positive influence on one of, it, it, one of its stakeholders and we measure that um, at the board level we incentivize our management teams against that uh, next they are not only incentivized on the uh, EBITDA or profitability they generate but also on the positive impacts they create on stakeholders with their product or services uh, we also look internally on how we do business uh, and so you know, ESG is a, uh, usually a term we hear a lot to, to, to talk about that. It, we, we see it even in a more broader way. It's, again, how our operations, how our supply chain um, are impacting different stakeholders. And so once again, uh, we, we act uh, with our management teams and through kind of the, the governance uh, that, that we have in businesses uh, to, to support uh, our businesses into reducing negative externalities and hopefully um, creating long-term uh, positive choices which can have uh, and maybe are not obvious uh, but are ones which uh, improve both outcomes on uh, social environmental outcomes so when it comes to you know to the to our fund strategy we we look at um, we, we, we look at uh, three general outcomes that we're trying to drive the first one is health and wellness uh, so that's all social determinants of health of our people as a stakeholder 
uh, sustainability, which is the environment as a stakeholder, and, uh, and education and workforce development, which is, which is people, but also more broadly communities, um, and, and, and that's actually tied to the public sector. And mm -hmm. So that's how, we, that's how we look at this. Wonderful. Thing. Thanks so much, Chris. Well, I think these, this theme of intentionality and measurability is so central, and I'm sure we'll come back to that in the, in the discussion. Uh, now let's turn to Donna. Now Donna is director of the private equity program. Of course, you see the ins, ins and outs of the industry. Uh, you've seen it evolving. Uh, how do we situate this phenomenon of ESG orientation of funds like Double Impact? Where do you see, the, what do you see as their role in the industry and how do you see that role evolving? So I'm here, first of all, thank you for asking me and thank you all for coming this evening. Um, so I'm here to give the dinosaur perspective uh, <laughs> because I've been around for a while. And so I find it very interesting. I find language very interesting. So um, what I think of when people say reducing externalities is, is a code word for driving returns, right? Because private equity has to drive returns. Uh, and when we talk about um, ecosystems, this ecosystem needs capital. And capital goes where there are returns. So I guess the question is, how do you, how is ESG different in terms of driving the returns? Because again, I'm, I'm not, that bright, so I think of things pretty simply. You know, you have three ways that you can create a return in a deal. If we're talking about buying a company, right? We can take minority stakes, and, and that's another issue I think we have when we talk about things like ESG and other things is, it's kind of slippery nomenclature. You know, the devil's, are, are we talking about public-private partnerships? Are we talking about just sort of global issues of ESG? And I think um, discussions kind of go a little bit off the rails when we're not kind of clear on what we're talking about. So here it seems like we have a kind of a, a broad discussion, but if I narrow it to just driving returns in, in one area, which would be buying a business, right? Um, if you leverage that business up, you create a return by, by paying down the debt. Mm -hmm. Now, we can pay down the debt in, you know, in a socially responsible way. I think that's, that's a good thing, and that, I think people just generally try to do that. Um, we can improve the business, and I think certainly, you know, keeping those metrics and thinking about those metrics of, of that in terms of um, improving the business are important. And then we can sort of, you know, hold the business and get lucky and sell it at a higher valuation. But at the end of the day, uh, this business, this segment, this asset class needs to deliver returns to Emily's constituents. Um, Maybe the constituents think about balancing their portfolio of investments in private equity as balancing it, I'm going to allocate this much to funds that only invest in these type of things. I, I can see that happening. Uh, but I think as long as the system is um, set up the way it is, with the incentives that it has, uh, whatever we call it, it's about driving a return. Mm -hmm. And you know whether we can set up some kind of a metric on how we ought to drive that return one way or another, that's, that's interesting. Now, the sustainability of this. Uh, one good thing about being a dinosaur is you've seen lots of things. Um, and so uh, I'm trying to sit here, there, there are other things we've thought about, I mean, you, in, in, in areas other than private equity too, and corporate governance, the Business Roundtable came out with their list of, of um, you know, what a corporation should focus on, right? So, uh, you know, people in a business school with almost a Pavlovian response would say, what's the purpose of a corporation? To create shareholder value. Well, when the business roundtable came out, shareholder value was noticeably placed last on the list. That's great. CEOs have um, stock options. <laughs> so I think CEOs are gonna be thinking about the value of their stock. So I think the devil's in the details and there are just so many things that are, that, are, that are interwoven in this. It's hard to sort of separate it out and say, we're talking about ESG as sort of a monolithic type of thing. So I definitely think it's here to stay. I think, especially driven by, by our European friends, uh, people are focusing on it. I think it's a good thing to focus on. I think it's a little slippery on what exactly it is and how you measure it. Wonderful. Well, you've given us a lot to think about there, Donna. And, you know, I think this, the whole discussion about the centrality of returns mm -hmm. is, is so pivotal. So, in fact, let's stay on that for a minute, if, if I may turn back to Emily. Uh, now, your stakeholders, your members are certainly interested in return. Absolutely. Uh, so, can you tell us? The, the category, the leader category you talked about, so those who are most deeply engaged in ESG, how have you seen them thinking about return and uh, ESG considerations being integrated? Sure. So uh, you're correct in that returns are paramount, um, particularly to our members, because they have beneficiaries who uh, they need to meet the needs of. And, and private equity happens to be the number one performing uh, alternative asset class within the pen private pension system. Uh, and uh, 
private pensions and, and other organizations need private equity. We are better off with private equity. So that being said, how do we look at private equity and make sure that uh, the investments that are being made do indeed align with the ideals of our beneficiaries and of our mission and of our organization? And uh, so the, the leaders are incorporating ESG into their investment decisions. Mm -hmm. Uh, they have ESG uh, strategies, they have ESG mandates, they have exclusions, areas where uh, uh, they uh, say, well, we, we will not put any of our money into these types of industries, typically uh, firearms, uh, probably cannabis, prob uh, often pornography, uh, something coming down the pike is private prisons, you will see more side letters that say, well, you know, please do not put any of our money into any kind of private prisons or... Uh, uh, detention centers. So um, so they establish those up front with their general partner and um, those are in the form of a side letter agreement. Uh, and, um, and then they monitor and they make sure that uh, the general partner is living up to the standards um, that they have set forth. Uh, they, uh, there's an organization called the PRI, uh, mm -hmm. Principles for Responsible Investment. Uh, many of um, our members and many of the general partners are signatories of the PRI guidelines, uh, and that indicates that they uh, will invest uh, along a certain number of parameters. Uh, so they are not only uh, act, uh, acting on um, these uh, ideals, but they're broadcasting them as well. Um, and then they have, they have uh, ESG specialists who are looking at every deal and reviewing every deal uh, or every GP fund manager um, to evaluate um, for uh, ESG compliance. Uh, once the deal's done, they're monitoring, they're getting reports, um, and the issue of um, measurement is so complicated, and I, I'd really be interested to hear from Chris about um, how you're measuring impact because uh, measuring ESG risk and measuring impact is different depending on where you sit. And uh, that's been one of the greatest challenges for our members is how do you measure and how do you monitor? Absolutely. Well, let's turn to Chris then on that. And, and you had talked about measurement. Chris, I wanted to add a question that was inspired by Donna's comments around incentives. Sure. So, so you, you, in your remarks, you mentioned metrics. Uh, tell us about your non-financial metrics and how they interact with the financial metrics. And then how do you create incentives both for the firm and also for your portfolio companies to achieve those metrics? Absolutely. Um, I, think, I think metrics are, and just measurement in general is, is interesting because it, it can have different functions even, you know, this is back to devils of the detail. Uh, you, can, uh, you can measure for comparability uh, or, I'll, just split it into to start with. I could get uh, more in detail, but you can measure for comparability, which is a really important point we're hearing today in the um, in the impact industry. Uh, how much units of impact am I creating for every dollar invested? Uh, and fund number one or fund number two might be creating different units of impact for dollar invested. That's its own whole own world. Then there's measurement to drive outcomes. You get what you measure. That's you know a rule of life. I hope they teach you that in business school still. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's just a, a management principle. Uh, and so that's how we think about measurement uh, and, and within our, our portfolio companies. So we, we define, when it comes to what we're doing with our business, what are our product services uh, um, and what type of impact uh, they're, they're, they're having, we define two or three company-specific metrics to measure the outputs they're having, which are linked to positive outcomes. But we measure the outputs. Why are the outputs? Because those are the ones which are directly linked to our product or service, where there's no, um, there's no bridge of assumption. Um, and, uh, and we measure those so specifically, and we tailor them to the company, because the outcome we're trying to get is not to compare this company, healthcare company A, to healthcare company B within my portfolio, which is a very in, in interesting exercise in itself, by the way, but that's not what I'm trying to achieve. I want my company to, uh, to achieve an extra unit of impact that the way we defined it. Um, and, and that's really specific to, to our strategy, frankly. Uh, it's, it's debatable uh, if that is the, the way you should, uh, but uh, it's, it's really driven the outcomes we're looking for um, and through, through the outputs. And, and it's only by having these type of metrics mm -hmm 
which are tied specifically to your business model, mm -hmm. that your incentives work. Sure. Well, to probe on that, have you, have you seen trade-offs? Because you know, Emily was suggesting that ESG integration is a risk mitigant. It's important for sustainable long-term returns. So um, you know, sort of saying that's part of the analysis for long-term return. Mm -hmm. Have you seen in your portfolio companies instances where they say, Chris, yes, we've got the social metric, yeah. but I'm concerned. Please, tell us about it. No, it's interesting. I, I, I'm going to take a risk here, but I'd love to hear a show of hands in the audience. Do you think there's a trade-off in, in a given ESG initiative within my portfolio with the bottom line? So show of hands. Yeah, for the camera, about 80%. Um, of course, of course there are trade-offs. Uh, and uh, there doesn't have to be, though. I think there, um, the, our role as an impact investor is to find, try to, to, to spend a little bit more time imagining how we can create business initiatives which do not have a trade-off. Mm -hmm. And that comes with the really basic tool we use, which is ex extremely effective, is looking at things long-term and on the short-term. Not being driven by a quarterly or even a yearly uh, time frame, but a five-year time frame. Uh, if I put in a training program for my employees, which has a short-term cost, will I have a positive impact on my turnover and on my productivity five years down the line? Uh, is that producing kind of better outcomes for my employees and for their families and their community? Um, those are real questions. That does not have a, that has a short-term trade-off, not a long-term trade-off. Again, trade-off is devil's in the detail. Um, and so I think the, the, the point we're trying to, in what we're trying to prove uh, within our portfolio in Double Impact, and we will try to prove in, in all our future investments, is not that there's no trade-off, because there is, and I don't think they would be intellectually honest to, to say that, um, but is there are, uh, there is, there are uh, initiatives that you can have at a business level which have positive impacts on different stakeholders mm -hmm. and that can be accretive to the bottom line. And that's, you know, that's what being a good capitalist should be. Uh, I always say the pioneers of impact investing are not community, you know, definitely not bank capital, definitely not the, the impact VCs we saw in the early 2000s, definitely not the community capital 20 years ago, but they were family offices and, and, uh, and family businesses 100 years ago who actually cared about their community and who uh, you know, did not pollute their backyard and took care, about the, took care of the families of their, of their companies. Those were good capitalists who uh, drove returns, drove their own personal wealth and were true capitalists, but also um, had a really positive impact around them. And so we're, we're you know, as an exercise, that's you know, the vision we're trying to go back to. We're, we're capitalists, no question about that, but we believe that there's a better way to, to, to do business um, if you just do a little bit more work. So maybe it's not so new after all. Absolutely not. So Don, as a scholar of this field, when you hear Chris talking about trade-offs, how do you react? Well, I, I think, I think <clears throat> thank you for being intellectually honest that there are trade-offs. And I think the biggest trade-off is holding period returns, right? I mean, you're talking about um, people got all crazy when we crossed over to over five years of a holding period of a, of a portfolio company. I mean, you're talking about periods in private equity where people were exiting after three years. So I think you know, having a training program which has long-term benefits is fabulous, but how does that affect your you know, ability to exit the business if you're gonna wait that five-year period to kind of evaluate it? I think, I think taking a longer-term view on private equity is, is interesting. I know Blackstone and other companies have, uh, have had long-dated funds, but again, that sort of changes the, the, the whole incentive scheme of the management team that wants to work with a private equity sponsor when you buy them. Right, because they're not, if they wanted to stay 20 years, but they'd stay at the corporate company that owns them now. You know, so I think that, again, that's the devil in the details. I do think you raise a couple of very intriguing points, and not the least of which is, if you think about private equity today, over 60% of private equity deals are add-on acquisitions. So it's something that a private equity firm is adding to their portfolio. So when I sat in the student seats uh, and graduated here from Columbia Business School and worked at First Boston, if I sold to a private equity firm, it was because I had no other buyers. I was like, it was, you know, it was a s hapless company, not a, and not a great valuation, and you know, I can't believe I had to do this, right? They had a financing condition in the deal, it was a low valuation, that was it. That's not the case today. Um, and consequently, I think by adopting the policies that you talked about, 
throughout their portfolio companies, they can have a very good positive impact. Uh, so I think that's one thing. I mean, given the fact that there's their sheer size by making some changes about types of vendors that they themselves will use, types of training programs that they're going to put their employees through, types of healthcare benefits that they're going to offer their portfolio companies, I think that can have a huge, a huge impact. Uh, I also I was intrigued by Emily's um, comments too, which I think is certainly you know within the the realm to say these are verboten industries. We don't want to go here. Um, and then you know private equity firms need the capital, and the LPs insist they don't want to invest in certain types of industries. Then you know that's it. I mean they're they're there to create returns. If the suppliers of capital have determined they don't want to go into these industries, then that's you know. That's so I I, I hear you saying change happens when returns are generated. So returns incentivize right. behavior. And I think we'll and, agree on that. I don't think sure. Absolutely. I think they'd all agree to so, that. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> and also, you're, I hear you saying that the, the supply of capital, of course, shapes mm -hmm. what uh, GPs do. And that's exactly the conversation we're having here. So, so that's wonderful.